Well, if you have your Bible, uh, turn me to Philippians chapter 3, and uh, if you are new with us, what we tend to do is uh, work our way through books of the Bible, kind of section by section. This is our, I don't know, eighth or ninth week in Philippians, and we'll continue in the text this morning, uh, going through verses 1 through 11. Uh, As pastors Chris and Adam alluded this morning, there are plenty of areas in our day uh, on which the church could be very easily divided. Think about the political world. Uh, We could be divided in in politics, uh, medical issues, social issues, economic issues. Uh, We're in the middle of a pandemic with a uh, a presidential race on our heels, and so tensions are high. So there are all kinds of ways and all kinds of areas in which we could very easily be uh, divided. It's easy to forget when we're going through the time that we are right now in history that the church has always faced threats to her unity. In fact, uh, this is actually the norm, not the exception. It's always been the case. Now, none of the issues that we're dealing with now uh, really are, were on the minds of the church maybe hundreds of years ago, but they had other issues. In fact, if you go back 300 years to the early 1700s, there was this incredible debate as some areas of our country, what the New England area uh, was experiencing what was called the First Great Awakening. And God was bringing people to saving faith by the thousands. People were on their knees before God, repenting. Some were were wailing. Some were sobbing. Some were actually trembling with remorse over the sins they had committed. And there was this huge debate that was sparked in the early 1700s between what was called the old lights and the new lights. And the old lights, who were led by the Reverend Charles uh, Chauncey, they said, look, all of these demonstrations that are going on, people wailing and sobbing and, and, and repenting with great emotions, this is all phony stuff. This is all bad stuff. This is not stuff that we should celebrate. And then those who were part of the new lights, uh, led in part by Jonathan Edwards, said, no, whenever the Spirit of God is at work, penetrating through the darkness and bringing people to repentance and faith, it will manifest in different ways. And when it does, we should celebrate that. Even if it makes us uncomfortable, even if it's not something that we are accustomed to, we should celebrate that. So you had this big debate again, going on between the old lights and the new lights. And really what it had to do was with was the value of religious experience. How much value, how much legitimacy should we put on religious experience? Now, more recently, the question has morphed from not so much the value of religious experience, but now it's the value of religion itself. In the late 1990s, there was a group that sort of... uh, came into the forefront of the media known as the New Atheists, led by Christopher Dawkins and, and or Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and others who would go on to say that, that religion is not just foolish, it's not just irresponsible, it's not just sort of the, the crutch for the weaker man. Religion is actually dangerous. And it was Richard Dawkins, kind of the best known of the so-called New Atheists, who would write, who would go on to say, religion is one of the world's great evils. And so, as we begin this morning, I ask you the question, is religion dangerous? Is religion dangerous? Now, if you answer that question too quickly or too hastily, you might be very surprised to see what we find in the text this morning as we continue to work our way through Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Uh, Let me start just by reading uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Here reads the word of the Lord. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So Paul begins, as a lot of preachers do when they reach the midpoint of their sermon. He says, finally, or or in closing, he's not actually closing. He still has a lot more to say. But he says, I want you to pay very close attention to what I'm going to say now. I've actually said it before, but I want it to really sink in this time. He says, finally, rejoice in the Lord. Now, the the word for rejoice is a a word that that actually means to actively sing God's praises collectively. So he's instructing this group of sort of beleaguered and exhausted Christians to actually be active and intentional about singing God's praises together together. To rejoice again is to make a commitment. It's a choice we make to sing 
the praises and the glories of God. It's one of the reasons I, I like the, the new song we sang this morning, Yes, I Will, because it communicates this commitment that we make. Yes, I will sing your praises in the lowest valley. Yes, I will sing the praises of your name, even when my heart is heavy, all my days. Yes, I will. There's something, there is something unique, there's something supernatural that takes place when God's people sing his praises together. We're not just commanded to rejoice, but to rejoice in the Lord. In other words, the Lord is both the reason for our rejoicing, and he is the source of our rejoicing. He is the reason in that he has brought us to saving faith. He has made us right with the living God. He has given us new life and a new hope for eternity. And so he is the reason that we rejoice. He's also the source of our rejoicing in that it's the the indwelling spirit of God the Spirit of God in us that actually gives us the ability to sing praises when our hearts are heavy, to to praise God's name in the lowest valley. And so Paul begins by saying that we are to practice this discipline of worship, praising, rejoicing God, because it is praise that actually comforts an anxious heart, in part. And maybe this is, maybe it's your story this morning. You've come and and you just feel like your world is upside down and nothing is going the way that you expected or wanted it, and you have discovered that when you sing God's praises, there's actually something very comforting about that. Worship is a response that confronts our anxiety. And the people of Philippi will actually need this because they are under attack. Now, here's what's interesting. The attack that they're under is not so much an attack from the outside but actually from the inside, from within the church. There is great danger that Paul is warning them about, but what is the danger? Look at verses 2 and 3. Paul says, Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So there was a group of people, and uh, they're actually attracting more and more people in the church at Philippi during Paul's day, and they made up a particular brand of Christianity, again, one that was growing at the time. And these people said, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. So, So we believe that. We believe He's the Messiah. Yes, He is the Christ. But if you really want to be part of God's family, if you really want to be approved by God, if you want to be accepted by God, You need to be circumcised if you're a male, just like God's people have always done throughout history. And by being circumcised, you then fulfill the law of Moses. And by keeping the whole law, even with its dietary restrictions and ceremonial aspects, you will be marked out as the true people of God. God will accept you. And there are people who are presenting this and teaching this, and Paul actually calls these people mutilators of the flesh, evildoers. He calls them dogs. Now, I have to clarify because um, the situation regarding dogs was very different in the ancient Greco-Roman world than it was than it is now. Today, dogs are treasured, right? But not not so much back then. I remember vividly when Janine and I bought our first house. We've been married about two years, and you know, we wanted to get to know our neighbors, and so we would watch from our window and we would watch when, when any of our neighbors would leave the house we would figure out some way that we could go outside and and some reason to go outside to introduce ourselves to them. And so we were one day we're sitting in the kitchen. We could see out through the front window in our kitchen. We saw our neighbor to the left, a middle-aged lady, walk out of her front door with two huge dogs, two chocolate Labradors. And so I thought, we haven't met her yet, so let's go out and, and let's, you know, we'll act like we're, I don't know, sweeping or something so we can meet her. So we went out, and she walks up. She has these two huge dogs. We introduce ourselves, and she goes, oh, I'm so sorry. You'll have to forgive the way that I look. We know she had a wet towel around her neck. She said, well, you'll have to forgive the way that I look. Just got out of the shower with the dogs. And I I, I had no category. I couldn't even begin to process what she was saying. I had no category to put this information. She could have told me that she was an alien who just returned from space on a spaceship captained by the Smurfs, and I would have received that better than her telling me she'd just gotten out of the shower with her dogs. She loved her dogs. Well, when we talk about, we say, if we read this, that Paul's calling these people dogs, we might think, well, that's really not so bad. Like, I love my dog. 
Well, in ancient Philippi, uh, nobody was showering with their dogs. Dogs were considered mongrels. Dogs were scavengers. Dogs were a nuisance. And so this was actually a very low blow that the Apostle Paul uses when he refers to these religious uh, folks. New Testament scholar Gordon Fee writes, the, reasons, the reason for the invective, which is this extremely intensely negative phrase, was such people have been dogging Paul for over a decade. And as the, the strong language makes clear, he has long ago had it to the belly full with these servants of Satan who think of themselves as servants of Christ. See, they weren't simply offering a different perspective on the Christian faith. They didn't have some sort of unique interpretation of an Old Testament passage. What they were doing is they were making the gospel what we're supposed to do rather than what God has done for us in Christ. And Paul says they are evildoers, they are mutilators of the flesh, and they are dogs. See, what they believe is they believe because of their circumcision that they're actually now children of Abraham, children of the one true God. But what Paul says is far from it, you're actually more like the children of the Baals, that is the false gods that we looked at in our series on the Ten Commandments, what you are is you're cutting yourself, you're mutilating yourself as a way to appease the gods. And this is not the way our God can be appeased. So for Paul, this teaching is toxic. It's very destructive. It has to be sniffed out in the church and eradicated at all costs. It's like, it's like a cancer that must be excised from the church. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Now, the flesh that Paul's talking about there is not necessarily the physical body, as if Paul is saying, look, don't put confidence in your physical body. Uh, don't trust in your own physical strength. The word flesh here refers to really things that can be shown off and admired by others, accomplishments, our moral record, our reputation, our kids' reputation, all of those things that we might want to believe make us superior people. So Paul says, no, the true children of God are not those who have been physically circumcised, but those who have placed all their faith, their hope in Jesus Christ. They put all their eggs in this single basket, and that is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But we still, I think it still begs the question, like why such strong language, even for people within the church, why such, powerful, such a powerful indictment? Well, this is where we really get to the heart of the matter. And this is, this is our first point this morning. The greatest danger we face as Christians is not our sin, but our righteousness. Now, I made that point intentionally provocative because I want you to wrestle with it, and I want you to stew on it for a little bit. I, 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 I'm okay if it, if it disrupts your thinking a little bit. And I also want to say this, I'm not, I'm not diminishing sin at all. Sin is a great danger. Sin is destructive. Sin is blinding. Sin is misleading. All of those things. There's a reason why I quoted John Owen a couple of weeks ago who said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you because sin can destroy us. But a greater threat to our spiritual well-being is actually a confidence in ourselves, trusting in our own righteousness. This subtle belief that I am right with God because of something I have done or not done, because of I'm a good person or I've been obedient or whatever it is. I preached through God, uh, Matthew's gospel a few years ago, and it took, it took over a year and a half to get through it. And one of the things that I recognized over and over as I'm preaching through this gospel is just how much Jesus rails against self-righteousness. More than any other sin, more than any other offense, it's self-righteousness. In fact, it was so frequent that it actually started to become really a preaching challenge because I, every week it seems like he's, he's against the Pharisees, he's against the religious leaders, he's calling out the, the self-righteous. And I, was, and I had to figure out, okay, where am I going to go with this? Because the theme kept resurfacing more, more than sexual sin, more than financial sin, more than relational sin, whatever it was, Jesus seemed to be most bothered by self-righteousness. And the reason I think for that is because unlike any other sin tendency, 
Self-righteousness blinds us from seeing our need for repentance and our need for a Savior. See, in Paul's case, it wasn't sin that kept him away from Christ. It was his righteousness. He didn't need a Messiah on the cross. He didn't need a dying Messiah. He was righteous in his own eyes. He knew what sin was, and he knew how bad it was. He knew, he knew that coveting was wrong. He says in his letters, he knew that lust was wrong. He knew it was bad. He knew what sin was, but the problem was he had to discover that it was, his righteousness was also bad in that it had become his Savior. That's actually what he was trusting in. One pastor and theologian says, the people who can be most blind to their need for Jesus are often the people sitting in church week after week. Jesus may be their hero, perhaps their inspiration, but he's not yet their righteousness because they haven't given up clinging to their own righteousness, which is not just a danger for unbelievers, of course. It's a danger for believers. Consequently, we are three times, Paul says, to watch out for this inclination towards self-righteousness and any teaching that promotes this work's righteousness. Watch out for it like we would a snake in our backyard. There's a guy, I met with a guy a couple of days ago, said he lives out in the country and he said he has to be careful because he has to watch out for snakes that will come up into his yard and under his deck. We are to watch out as we would for snakes in our backyard or like we would for a cockroach in our sandwich. I mean, it's a disgusting notion, but this is sort of the theme. Like we would for, we would watch out for a predator in our nursery. This is the, the sense of urgency that Paul's communicating here. Watch out, he says. Do not tolerate this teaching or this mindset. Do not let it sneak up on you and inhabit your own heart. Now, just in case we might be thinking, well, I mean, this is really strong language from the Apostle Paul, but surely this, this is all sour grapes, right? I mean, he's just frustrated because he's not in the group of these religious people who are attracting the attention of the church members. He, he wants to be in their group, and he's just frustrated, so he's lashing out. Well, Paul says, no, nothing could be further from the truth. He says, are you kidding me? I was not only once a member of this club, but I used to be the president. Look at verses 4 through 6. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more, he says. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So the Apostle Paul says, look, I don't care what you think about your own righteousness or how far along you are in your faith. I actually have more to boast about. I, too, was circumcised and on the eighth day. I, too, not just an Israelite, but a member of one of the only two tribes of Israel that remained faithful to the Davidic Empire when the other tribes fell away. Paul says, I, too, am a Hebrew of Hebrew, only I didn't learn Hebrew in Greek school like so many of you. I was taught Hebrew with my mother's milk. I learned it as an infant. I dream in Hebrew. And so I'm further along than all of you. He says, I'm not, I wasn't just a law keeper, but a Pharisee, the most pious among all the religious of the day, a persecutor of the church. In other words, Paul considered himself to be a prophet like Isaiah, who was pointing out the false prophets of the day. As to the law, he was blameless. In other words, there was nothing outwardly at least, about which Paul couldn't say, I have kept the law completely. So you see what Paul's doing here. Paul is presenting his spiritual resume. He's saying, he said, here it is. Take a look at my credentials. Look at my resume and tell me if you can compare. I don't know. I know we have had some folks, a few folks through pandemic who've maybe lost a job or had to switch jobs. And if you've had been on the search for something better, you've probably put together a resume lately. Uh, my son was considering, before he started grad school, you know, looking for a job, so he put his resume together. Here's what it looks like. has his experience, his accomplishments, his education, his awards, his references, and so on. A resume is really a defense of our qualifications. A resume is, is our way to open doors 
so that we can, we can get in. It's, uh, it's kind of like an argument or a case that we present on why we belong, why we should get in. The doors are closed, as it were, to that company you want to work for, that organization you want to join, that school you want to study at. So you think, if I just send my resume, then I'll get in. And here Paul says, just look at my resume. Look at my credentials. If anybody has done enough to gain entrance into God's kingdom, surely I have. But then he reassures these Philippians that Christ and his righteousness are infinitely more valuable than anything that the best sort of pious law keeping could offer. Look at verses 7 and 8. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You were used to the Apostle Paul. If you've read any of the Apostle Paul letters, and I know many of you are reading through the Bible in in a year, and I think that's wonderful, you notice that the Apostle Paul typically, his go-to as it relates to imagery and metaphor is actually athletic language. This is kind of his go-to. So he'll say, I have fought the fight. I have finished the race. I have run with endurance. I've, I beat my body into submission, he says, using a boxing analogy, in order to, to, to withstand or to fight against sin or whatever it is. So he usually employs athletic imagery. But here he uses banking, the language of banking. I count everything a loss, he says, for the surpassing worth of Jesus. Again, I suffered the loss, he says, of all things. He's using banking terminology to dramatize how radically Jesus has reshaped his thinking and reoriented his priorities. One commentator writes, every deposit that Paul thought he had been making into his account in the presence of God was actually, he now knew, just one more debit. The best stuff he's got. His very Best days. I'm talking about days he gets up early, he prays for over an hour, he helps people around him, he serves, he gives everything he has, he keeps his mind pure to the best of his ability. His very best days, Paul says. He says, that all the stuff he was so proud of, it's rubbish. Scubala in the Greek. Literally, it's crap. King James says it's dung. As forcefully as he can, the commentator continues, Paul pronounces the resume in which he once rested his confidence to be both personally repellent and objectively defiling before the face of God. Paul says, all this stuff I've done, all these credentials, all these accolades, all these degrees, it's a stench in the nostril of God when I put it to the center of the table and I say, God, now... Receive me. If I'm to be received by God, he says, it's going to take something else. Here's our second point. The loss that God commands is not necessarily the abandonment of possessions, but the renunciation of all confidence in our goodness. I've heard this passage preached, I don't know, many times, maybe where the the whole point is this. Paul gave away everything he had, He surrendered all of his possessions for Jesus, and you should too. Well, sometimes God does call people to relinquish everything they have and to move into some far-off place cross-culturally to serve and to minister for him. But that's not what this is about at all. This has nothing to do with that. Paul's not saying that you've got to get rid of everything you own, you've got to surrender all your possessions and so on. The point is God calls every Christian to surrender everything we might be inclined to to put our trust in outside of Jesus Christ. In other words, there is no spiritual resume that we can present to God by which God would accept us. It all stinks. It's all rubbish. Now, none of us would claim the things that the Apostle Paul has claimed. I don't know if there's anyone. I don't think there's anyone here who's from the tribe of Benjamin, and certainly there are no uh, first century Pharisees here. But I wonder, I wonder what we have on our spiritual resume? What are those things that you might be relying on? What's on your spiritual resume? What is that thing 
that helps you when you look in the mirror and you want to know that you're okay with God? What do you go to? What is your, your go-to consolation when you consider God? Yeah, well, at least I'm not whatever. At least I've never been unfaithful to my spouse. You had that up at the top of your spiritual resume. At least I've never been addicted to drugs. At least I don't look at pornography. At least I finished college. At least I've never been violent with anyone. At least I didn't vote for so-and-so. At least I'm not of this political party. At least my kids are obedient. Right? Unlike so-and-so. How many, how many of us as parents are... We put so much stock in our, in our kids' obedience, our kids' performance. I had a lady who said to me one time, and I, I had no idea why she said I, I didn't say anything at all that would have sparked this comment from her. We're just, we were talking about something else, and she said to me, you know, she mentioned her daughter's name. This is many years ago. Nobody you know. She mentioned her daughter's name. She said, you know what? My daughter and her boyfriend, they've been dating for three years, and they've maintained their sexual purity. I didn't, I didn't ask her anything about that. I didn't ask her anything about that. Now, I happen to know because her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend had come to me for counseling that that was actually not true. But this was so important to her. This was so critical to her that she put everything. This was at the very top of her spiritual resume. God, my kids are obedient. My kids are pure. What is it that you're holding on to? Because whatever it is, God's going to take it. And he's going to take your resume. He's going to rip it in half. Whatever we present to God that we would expect would be enough to actually satisfy a holy God won't get us anywhere. Whatever it takes, whatever it is that we go to in order to feel good about ourselves, in order to feel accepted by God, that actually has become, functionally speaking, our righteousness. That is what we're clinging to for God's approval. And Paul says that as it relates to our justification, being declared right before God, all of that has the same effect on God as a pile of dung. But if that's the case, what hope do we have? Look at verses 8 through 11. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, I've given up everything. That is to say, every accolade, every right, every achievement, every praiseworthy accomplishment, I've given it up because I know it counts for nothing in God's economy. And all I want to do is I want to know Christ. I want to be found in Him. In fact, to know Christ is to be found in Him. This is not some extra intimate sort of relationship. Paul was up against, in in some of his context, this group of people known as the Gnostics, or from from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And they were saying, no, if you're really a Christian, you have to have this special secret knowledge that we have, but we can't really tell you because you wouldn't get it. And Paul says, this is not what he's saying. He's, He's talking about to know Christ. He's not talking about some special secret thing. To know Christ is actually to be found in Christ. To know Christ is to belong to Him, to be Jesus' brother and to have God as our Father. And I said to you as we started this series that these two verses may be my favorite in the whole Bible. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but a righteousness that comes from faith. And you say, well, why why would that be your favorite? It's not necessarily so I can strengthen my theological understanding or fill out my theological grid. The reason that I love those verses is because it's a great comfort to me as a person who consistently fails to keep God's standard as a person who consistently falls infinitely short of the perfection that God has required. So when I'm impatient with my kids, when I'm impatient with the driver, 
when I'm self, selfish in my motivation, when I'm thinking only about myself, when I give in to temptation, I find great comfort in knowing that it's not my righteousness that counts, but is the righteousness that is mine by faith. Let me give you my, our final point, then I'll illustrate it for you. Here's the final point. Believers receive Christ's righteousness as a gift, which completely satisfies all that God requires. I, I, I try to think about the best example of this, and I think maybe the best example was Martin Luther's favorite, and that is, it has to do with marriage. And so when two people are united in marriage, what each one has becomes the other person's. So when you get married, whatever your wife has now belongs to you. Whatever you have belongs to her. And so when Janine and I were married at 22, what immediately became hers was a closet full of Air Jordans, which she would never go on to wear, a CD collection of classic rock bands and 90s rap, which she wasn't uh, as into as I was. And somehow those CDs ended up disappearing. Uh, but now I have Spotify, so the joke's on her. But, um, but that disappeared, so that became hers. Um, a 1984 Datsun Nissan Maxima, that became hers. Um, a lot of college debt, which instantly became hers. She didn't want, but she accepted. And when we got married, what, what became mine, what, what I immediately uh, had was a collection of Mickey Mouse sweatshirts, which I never wore. Um, her nursing equipment or stethoscope and, and things like that. Um, I received her fancy Spanish figurine known as a yadro. You, you ever seen a, you know what a yadro is? Here's a picture. Um, it's a very fancy, exquisite figurine. Now, you'll notice this one is actually missing a left arm. I happened to knock it over one day, and I knocked off the arm, which didn't go well in my first year of marriage. Uh, but Janine forgave me, and then I tried to convince her that it actually had greater value, just like the ancient Greek statue of uh, Venus, which only has the one arm, uh, but she never really received that. Um, but all those things became mine, and what I had became hers. And this is kind of like it is in marriage. Paul says, when I was joined to Jesus, and such is the case with all believers, everything that was his became mine, and everything that was mine became his. So what became his? My guilt and my sin and my condemnation. And what became mine? His perfect obedience, his righteousness before God, and the fullness of life. This all became mine by faith. I get his life. He gets my sin. I get his verdict, God's verdict reserved for Jesus, not guilty. Now that verdict becomes my verdict, not guilty. This is the great exchange of the Christian faith. As I've said to you before, the language of the Christian faith is not primarily about morals. It's not a language of morality. I know we think it is. I know we think it is. We have to be better and stop cussing and stop getting angry and stop lusting and be more patient. All those things. Those are all good things. But the language of the Christian faith is not primarily a language of morality. It is a language of substitution. He lived for me. He died for me. He was raised again for me so that I could be right with God. Something I had no power to do on my own now is mine simply by receiving it as a gift. All of which means that we now know him by faith. And something else is ours as well. We share in the power of his resurrection, verse 10. As we share in his suffering, which we talked about extensively two or three weeks ago, If you want to know more about what it means to suffer in Christ, and you feel like, I'm not really suffering, you go back and listen a couple of weeks ago. As we share in His suffering, we also share in the power of His resurrection. That power that raised Jesus from the dead is constantly at work in the life of the believer. As we suffer, which we most certainly will, God's power is at work in us, sustaining us and preserving us and and enabling us to have faith and empowering us to rejoice, spurring on our obedience, conforming us into the image of God's beloved Son. And because of that great exchange, Christ's righteousness for our sin and God's continual work in us by His power, 
we now live as those in Christ with an incredible, unsurpassed freedom. The freedom from condemnation. So this morning, if you're in Christ, you don't have to wonder where you stand before God. You don't have to worry about what God thinks of you. The freedom from guilt. And I know people right now, these are people you don't know. I know people right now who have sinned in their life when, before they were married, when they were first married, whatever it is. Maybe it was a, a terrible sexual sin or abortion or it was some sort of cr- a crime they committed. And they've never actually shared those things with anyone else other than me or another pastor. And they live with constant guilt. But if you're in Christ, you don't have to live with guilt. Jesus has taken my guilt and my shame and your guilt and your shame on the cross We live now with a freedom from fear. I was talking to a guy just this week, an older gentleman who was was reflecting on COVID and the ups and downs and the spikes and the lulls. And he said, I have to be honest with you, I'm actually afraid of dying. And I understand it. I get this. But for those who are in Christ, there's nothing to fear because we know what's on the other side. We know what's in store for us. We We now have the freedom, get this, The freedom to repent. The freedom to admit that we're wrong. The freedom even to repent of our righteousness, as the Reformer said. All of those things that we're holding on to so tightly just to show that we know what we're doing, to show that we're right. So let me return to the question I started with. Is religion dangerous? Well, I think in light of the passage this morning, we have to say the answer is it depends on what you mean by religion. Any philosophy, any system of beliefs that promotes the idea that we can work our way to God, that we can earn our salvation through the law, through our obedience to God's commands, through our sacrifice, through our service, whatever it is, It necessarily leads to all the things we mentioned a moment ago that Christ has freed us from. That that equation, Jesus plus something, always leads to guilt because we never know. Have I done enough? What else do I have to do? Was today a sort of day where my good would outweigh my bad, whatever it is? Certainly leads to condemnation, the feeling of condemnation. Leads to fear. All of those things. Do you want a life filled with a constant burden to justify yourself and prove to others that you know what you're doing, that you're handling things? Do you want to live with the guilt and shame over past sins? Do you want to live with this constant, unrelenting need to be right all the time, to always be right, never able to repent, always under the pressure to show that you're a good person? Well, if that's the case... Cling to your own righteousness. Try to earn God's favor by your obedience. It's a dead-end street. It's an exhausting street. But do you want a life of freedom where you don't have to be right all the time? You don't have to pretend to be perfect. You don't have to constantly justify your existence. A life where you can be constantly assured of your value and your worth before God. If that's that's the case, then receive the righteousness of Jesus by faith. Believe on Him. Repent of your sins, but also repent of your...